Okay. So today, this seminar is going to be going over logistics, and then the other half will be going over ethics and inclusivity. So the first is going to be your tab room account. Um, you guys will need to be doing this after this seminar, so don't forget. So basically, what is tab room? It's just a website platform that a lot of tournaments use. Um, it's online. So setting up a tab room account. So if you go to tabroom.com and click sign up, you, you have to fill in the box with all your information. So email, first name, middle name, and all this. And then after that, you'll see a page like this and you'll say your competitor. And then um, you'll link your NSD account to your tab room account. And most of the times I think you'll only get your NSDA account via your school. I'm pretty sure. So, um, yeah, just ask your coach about that when you get to school. Uh, setting up, okay, so put your cell phone info so you can get texts. So when you're in round, you'll get alerts like, oh, round three pairing against so-and-so who and your judge. And you'll also want to put your email because you'll get the same thing just in case you don't check your texts. So that's super important. Otherwise, you won't get to your round. And the second part, so online tournaments. So I think in Alabama. Hmm? Uh, someone can't see the slides. Can everyone else see the slides? Confused. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. So the first part is online tournaments. Um, I'm pretty sure Alabama circuit won't be doing any online tournaments. But like, if you do happen to compete on the national circuit, the first half of this year is gonna be online. So once you've signed up for a tournament, on the weekend of your tournament, you go to tabroom.com and log into your account. So I've already logged in, logged in in this picture and you click future or current to see the tournament. So here it says current or future. Normally it'll say current on like the weekend of. Um, and then on the morning of your tournament, you click your email at the top right and a link to your NSA room should be present. And that's how you get into your room. So a virtual courtesy is basically when you join the call, if there's other people in the room, you want to say hello to like the judge and your opponents and have your camera on, not off, just so like they know that you're there and not like off eating lunch somewhere. And the second is in-person tournaments. So in an in-person tournament, once you get a notification of your round or pairing, you have to go over to your room. Um, if the judge is not there, you're not supposed to go in the room. You just wait outside in the hall. And when you walk into the room, greet your judge, same thing as like an online tournament. And like, this is what a pairing would look like. See, so round one, uh, it was XO versus Bergen something. And I was judging a tournament and then start time and then the room. So after the round, uh, don't immediately leave the call or pack up because judges will give you an RFD or reason for decision, um, it'll normally take like five minutes. It's not that long. Um, and courtesy is to not post round, which is basically arguing against the judge or like intimidating the judge with a bunch of questions that like say like their decision is wrong or something. Um, and then you also wanna thank the judges and opponents. Uh, you'll also after the tournament get like your RFD written. Uh, so it'd be like an overall reason for ranks and decisions. So like that's that, that's what everyone sees. And then you'll have the comments specific to your team or your code. So this was the State of Hill VTT, me and Amit, and then this is like our certain uh, sp comment specifics, specific comments. So are there any questions on logistics? And definitely set up a tab room account because you're gonna need it to compete at tournaments. Um, so if there's no questions, we're gonna talk about ethics and inclusivity now. Okay, so the first part is tournament ethics, what you should do at the tournament and what you shouldn't do. All right, so debate decorum is basically the do's in debate. So first thing is you wanna use tab room to check for your judge paradigm. So as soon as you get the postings of who you're debating, who you're going against, who your judges, go to tab room, 
enter that judge's name on the tab, uh, see if they have a paradigm, which is basically their preferences and read through those. Um, and if you see that they don't have a paradigm, you can always ask the judge, what are your preferences after both opponents enter the room? Um, so an example on the right is an example of my paradigm, which I have not updated in a really long time, but it's like my preferences and I like have progressive arguments of how I feel about progressive args and PF, um, rebuttal preferences, summary preferences, um, stuff like that. And Graham said to show Zach's entire paradigm, but Zach wrote a novel. He didn't have a paradigm. He had a whole book. Um, but usually that's like what it shows the judges, like what, uh, or you, it, the judges tell you what they want to see from you. And this is how you get good speaker points too. Um, so you want to start your speeches by asking, is everyone ready or is anyone not ready? And then in advance rounds, I don't know if this is the same with LD, but for PF, when people are spreading, which is which means speed reading, and you can't understand what they're saying, you can like raise your hand or like raise a fist. And usually that signals for you to slow down um, and you can't understand them. But also keep in mind, if you can't understand your opponents, the judges probably won't either. Oh, you can also say clear. That's what clear, a lot yeah. of people need to. Awesome. Um, and for before we go to prep time ethics, another thing is like speaker points. I don't know if you guys know what that is, but a 30 is like the highest number of speaker points you can get. But the reason why you need to know about like debate decorum, debate ethics, is that if you don't follow these, a lot of the times the judges will dock speaker points. And speaker points are really important in terms of like ranking which seed you are to see if you advance into like quarterfinals, semifinals, whatever. Um, and basically prep time ethics is what you should do during prep time. So what you can do is prep during your opponent's prep time. So if your opponents take prep, that's prep for you too, that's free prep. Um, and prep during your own time too. Uh, you can prep during crossfire if, well, LD people can't, but in PF, you can prep during crossfire if like your, it's a, your, your uh, partner's crossfire and you can prep then. You can also prep during um, other people's speeches, but you wanna be careful though, because you still need to flow their speech. So it's like a last resort if you're really running out of prep time. Um, and I would say that you should divide out your prep time super strategically. And uh, like in PF, I know one thing that some teams do is that after the first team reads their case, the other team takes prep time to prepare their rebuttal. So their opponents don't know what they're running yet. So they can't steal prep time. Um, so what you should not do is you should not prep during ev like evidence exchange in the sense that if you want to see a piece of evidence, you have to start your prep time. You can't just steal prep time. And you also need to prep. Uh, you cannot prep before starting your prep time. You'll be in charge of keeping your own prep time and um, you need to make sure that you're being super reasonable and this is that you're not prepping before you started the time. And you have to make sure you keep track of your own prep time. Usually judges don't keep track of how much time you use, but it's like, you should be truthful in how much time you have left for prep. Okay, so this is an example of like evidence ethics. Um, you need an evidence speech doc, especially since it's like all online debating this or this last year, you need to put all of the pieces of evidence and cards that you read on a separate doc and you need to email it to your opponents usually, which is usually required at like a national tournament. So you'll have your opponent's evidence, they'll have your evidence. Make sure you can revoke access to that doc after the round is over. But um, this is basically called like disclosing where you're both disclosing what you're gonna run against the other team a couple of like minutes or right before the round starts. Um, and if Zach wants to, pull up the two documents, I can show an example of like what my card file looked like when I would email it to my opponents. So this is an example of like my case that I keep for myself. Um, and there's like cards at the bottom. And then I'll show you an example of what we send to our opponents. So this is what we send to our opponents. I don't send our entire case. 
I send the cards that we read in order in our cases and the bolded parts of that we actually read. Um, so this is what you guys will send each other. You'll receive all the evidence from your opponents. I send over mine. Usually this doesn't happen in Alabama debate, but if you're going to like a national tournament, it's, it's becoming a norm to share your um, like cards, the evidence that you're gonna read in uh, your case and in your rebuttal. Okay, so um, another thing is you want to paste all the cards that you're planning to read in your rebuttal on a document. And that's what we call a speech doc in PF. Not sure if the same in, in LD, but um, you wanna send it to your judges and your opponents before starting your rebuttal speech. So they have like a list of like all the evidence that you're gonna read. Um, and if you send your evidence, your opponents are expected to do the same. Week in 2007 furthers that the bailout Sorry. left Mexico much better off than its that is, that's what we watched similar in prices the, without US support. And and they, you know, I don't know if that the audio caught through, but um so yeah, so if you don't send your evidence, then I mean if your opponents don't send their evidence, you're not really expected to send yours either. Um and another thing is there's a thing called like the wiki debate page. Whereas where like debaters who debate on the national level share all of their prep online, they like disclose it. So if you are going against an opponent that has all of their cases published online, they're probably gonna expect you to do the same and prep them out, of course. Do you want me to show them the wiki or? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So this was, this is this year's, well, let me go to last year. And then defense, uh, we already kind of looked at this. Okay. A uh, big team last year was Bethesda Chevy Chase GT. And they were the number one team and they disclosed like at every single tournament. So they have the tournament here. You have to put your tournament, the round, your opponent you went against, and then the judge. Um, then here they open source. I don't think you're going to be able to see it, but if I click it, it'll download onto my computer. And then what they'll have is like just a list of all the cards that are uncut, but it's like the tag, the citation, and then the paragraph. And like the thing about the wiki is you don't have to have the cut card, just like the paragraph that you read from. And then like, it'll still go by. And then some teams also just like send their entire case with like all the normal reading and stuff, but yeah. Okay, so this is what you wanna follow when you are calling for evidence, which means um, like a piece of evidence sounds like too good to be true, or you want to see an evident piece of evidence from, hey Zach, will you go back to the slide? Um, yeah, if you wanna like see a piece of evidence from your opponent, you call for the evidence. So um, an example is like, like, the three this was a couple years ago but there's always this card that people read that was like there's going to be a 300 percent chance of world war and it's like that sounds absurd so it's probably too good to be true so we would call for the card and then like when you read the card in your prep time it was seeing that like the study really just only analyzed one part of africa so if your opponents also misconstrue evidence and you see that they're misciting a card call them out in your next speech or run the debate, but that's like a whole different thing. Um, and the thing is, it's also like when you're calling for evidence, you wanna be strategic. If there's a piece of evidence that you think is really good and could help your own case, call for it, write down the card name and then research it out of the brown and use it in your own case. Um, but this is why it's like super important to cut your cards correctly because you don't wanna like misconstrue your evidence um, and like, then your opponents can use that against you. Another thing is, is you want to have your cards organized because a lot of judges do this thing where if you can't find a certain piece of evidence that your opponents called for within two minutes, they strike the evidence from the flow. So that means they no longer look towards that piece of evidence when evaluating who wins around. And it honestly just looks really bad on you when you can't find a piece of evidence that your opponents are asking for. 
And on the computer, if you have a Mac, Command S is your friend because you can like search for words in a certain document. Okay, the second part what we're gonna talk about is inclusivity and debate. Um, so before like we go on to trigger warnings, just a brief like overview of what I mean by inclusivity is that debate is inherently a very elitist and um, activity in the sense that the, the people who you see succeeding in debate are predominantly male. They're, they have a lot of resources. They usually go to private schools who give them really good coaching. So debate in itself is a really hard activity to get into because the people who have more resources um, tend to do better. And there's just like a lot of biases in debate. But we're gonna go on with trigger warnings. So another thing is a way to make debate more inclusive and more welcoming is that uh, to use trigger warnings. So when you use them, you use them whenever you mention topics in your speech, this could be your constructive, your rebuttal, whatever speech that could, that's like a sensitive topic and it could trigger someone. So for example, if you're talking about suicide, domestic violence, mental health issues, gun violence, and anything with identity, I would give, someone a trigger warning in the beginning of the speech so it's how do you use them is before starting your speech you want to you want to preface with like just a trigger warning this speech contains topics pertaining to like suicide please step outside if you feel uncomfortable by this topic um that way people who are personally dealing with these issues and don't want to hear about it in a speech can step outside if they and, and not have to like hear about it um if they're uncomfortable with it and these trigger warnings are really important because it creates a safer environment for debaters because what we have to remember is we are talking about real world issues that are actually affecting people. It's not just, oh, let's run a topic to win a round. It's that these topics actually affect people in real life. So we don't want to create an environment where it harms anyone's well-being during a round. We don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. And you don't want to desensitize topics just to win a round. Um, that's just like not right. So definitely use trigger warnings. And a thing that you'll notice is that if you are like later in debate, if you're talking about a super serious issue that you don't give a trigger warning against, a lot of the times debaters will read like, what is it? Is it theory against them? Zach, what is it called? Some, it's like yeah, a theory show. Yeah. Th okay. Yeah. A T-shell. They would read like T-shells against you basically saying that they didn't give, you should drop the debater because like they're not promoting like, um, like an inclusive space. I don't really know. Theory isn't that big in PF. So I don't really use theory, but yeah. And advanced lab, you'll learn a little bit about it this week. Okay, another thing is, is that Tabroom recently updated its site where when you're creating your profile, you can put your pronouns um in it which is like you know your gender identity whatever so you see that I have like she her in my um tab room account and that'll like pop up on your you know debate feed so you're not like accidentally misgendering someone because you don't want to like call your opponent by the wrong like pronoun and round because it also just looks worse for you because debate is becoming more and more progressive so you want to keep this in your thing. Okay, so as fun as the bait is, as like an activity, we have serious issues in the community that have gotten better, but they're still there. So it's, this is just like kind of giving you guys like a rundown of what is going on in the debate community, but there's a lot of like, gender discrimination in the sense that you're not gonna go against a lot of female debaters. Um, so all of this are like things that have actually happened. So judges, especially in Alabama, judges have a bunch of biases. So instead of like talking about how someone debates in the round and talking about the arguments, a lot of judges have commented about like the types of clothes you're wearing. Um, and it's like, uh, and for girls, like there's a constant norm of like being spoken over. And you need to have like a good balance of like not coming off as aggressive, 
but being assertive, which is a fine line in between both. And we have had judges, like, I kid you not, there have been judges who have commented on one of, like, someone from our team, from the Vestavian debate team, um, and they've said that, like, her voice was too high, and it made listening to her speech hard to, like, actually listen to, which is ridiculous, but stuff like this happens in debate. You just have to kind of move forward and just kind of just know that it's not always going to be fair, but it's not impossible to overcome. Um, and another thing is, is like in high school, a lot of the times there are like gender exclusive prep groups in the sense that a lot of like guys debaters create prep groups without like female debaters. And that's something you always want to avoid. Like a thing with debate is like you want everyone to feel comfortable in being in the community. So you have to be super careful when you're creating all of these prep groups, you're not excluding anyone um, just because of external factors. And another thing is, is there are going to be, there's like racial discrimination too, in the sense that judges really judge based off of like your appearance. Um, and a lot of judges like confound your intelligence and reliability based off of like how you look. Um, so like ideas like how to overcome this is all of us have our implicit biases in the sense that we don't know these are biases that we hold, but you should know that like 100% of us have biases in the sense that we view people unfairly, not because we try to, but because they're like implicit and they're like drilled in our brain. So it's just like recognizing that and being super careful of like what you're saying to someone and you like make sure that what you're, you you want to think twice before saying something that could be offensive um, because that'll go back and that'll like come back to bite you and it'll harm you. Okay, another thing is, is there's like, a lack of representation because debate is expensive. Um, part of the reason why we have Tempest is because it's free and like debate camp costs like three, $4,000. So debate is like a game for the rich, the wealthy and like the big private schools because um, compared to, you know, like even in Birmingham, like our inner city schools, their debate programs, they don't have as much funding and resources to travel and go to national tournaments as say Mountain Brook, Vestavia, um, and like Altamont do. So definitely there's like a lack of representation there. Um, and you know, like representation in the past has improved, but you know, we're still lacking representation, which is why it's super important to make sure you're super careful of like how you treat your opponents, how you treat your judges. So people actually join the activity and not drop out. Um, and another thing is, is like, there's like this huge wealth disparity in debate because, you know, they're all expensive. Not a lot of people can afford paying hundreds of dollars to go to like Kentucky for a random tournament. Um, not a lot of people have like money that they can pay for people to prep for them or like pay to go to these camps. Uh, so that's why there's like a lot of like wealth disparity in debate. Um, and I wrote an essay for this for my AP Lang project. If you want to read more about wealth disparity, it's there, but it's just like talking about how expensive debate is. Um, so how can we, did I get a good grade on it? I think I did. Mr. Senate really liked it. Um, but anyways, how can we make debate a more inclusive activity? Basically, it's like implicit bias training. So it's like not a straightforward answer of how do we make this activity better? It's just how can we as individuals make it more inclusive? Um, so basically what implicit bias is, is like a bias or prejudice that is present but not consciously held or recognized. Um, and it shows that studies showed that students have a lot of uh, implicit biases in regards like race, ethnicity, nationality, gender, social studies, and distinctions. So the first step in overcoming this is like think to yourself, what implicit biases do I hold? And how do I treat, say, like someone differently? Like if you went up against, I don't know, like a small, like Asian girl, how would you have treated her in the round compared to if it were like some tall man, you know? Like be conscious about how you're viewing people and make sure you don't treat people differently just based off of what they look like. Um, another thing is like being an ally. So if you see something wrong, speak up. Don't accidentally misgender someone. If you do, it's okay, it's a mistake. Apologize, um, learn from it. Don't speak over someone. 
don't get into this mindset where you're like, oh, I have to be the more dominant one to make it look like I'm dominating cross. Like, no, that just makes you seem like you're treating the other person unfairly. So you have to find a good balance between not interrupting someone, not speaking over someone, but also still getting your points across. Um, and no ad hominem, which means don't personally attack your opponents. You should be attacking their arguments and why their arguments are wrong. You should not be attacking the person. Um, so don't do that. And then you want to treat everyone with respect, no matter what happened. All right, any questions?